so thank you. As everyone here is aware, last Tuesday, January 12th, shortly before 5 p.m., a massive 7.0 earthquake struck Haiti, 10 miles southwest of the densely populated capital city of Port-au-Prince. International relief agencies put at 3.5 million the number of people affected by the quake. And recent estimates of the dead are in the range of 200,000 men, women, and children. In some neighborhoods in Port-au-Prince, as well as in Carrefour, Jacmel, and Leogan, estimates of the percentage of buildings collapsed run as high as 80%. Major relief efforts are underway, but under the constraints imposed by massive damage to <coughs> infrastructure on the one hand, and on the other by what some would classify as a misplaced priority on security narrowly conceived rather than on relief. Meanwhile, the world is riveted, at least for now, on images of physical devastation and death unfolding, as we are told, in the poorest country in the hemisphere. Confronted with stories and images of Haiti's earthquake and its aftermath, many people are asking themselves similar questions. Why have the effects of the quake been as devastating as they have been? What kind of recovery and reconstruction are possible? What is the role of the United States or of other nations and international bodies in the current crisis and beyond. And in the face of such calamity, we ask ourselves, what is our own duty to be in any number of capacities, as individuals, as Americans, as Haitian Americans, as lawyers, students, scholars, and educators? Tonight's panel stems from our conviction that to approach the, such questions, we need to push past the often thin and sensationalist coverage of Haiti that is so readily available in the mainstream media. In thinking about this unprecedented crossroads, we are obligated to provide a deeper and more contextualized understanding of Haiti's past and present. To this end, we brought together tonight a panel of historians, cultural critics, lawyers, and policy analysts to provide their perspective on the, cri on the crisis that continues and will continue to unfold in Haiti. And without taking any further time, because I know there are a lot of people here and there will be a lot of questions and there are a lot that has to be said, I just want to turn the mic over uh, to our first panelist. I will do introductions right before they speak so you know who's speaking when you're uh, speaking, and then we'll open up for, for questions and discussion. Our first speaker tonight is Sibylla mm -hmm. Fisher, who is also co-organizer of tonight's event. Professor Fisher is chair of the Spanish department here at NYU and author of the award-winning book, Modernity Disavowed, Haiti and the Cultures of Slavery in the Age of Revolution. She continues to work on Haiti and in December was in Port-au-Prince working on a current project on, on art and contemporary writing in Haiti. So I'll turn the mic over to you. So much, Alain. Thanks for taking the lead in organizing this event. Um, the catastrophe of January 12th is beyond human comprehension. In fact, it is beyond imagination in the very precise sense that you cannot want to imagine it. But it is also produced as incomprehensible by the media. Dead black bodies wherever you look. People without name, without history, without location, mere bodies, all black, all shoveled into mass graves without much to do. So different from our protective sense of bodily integrity in the North, yet familiar, since it is Haiti, exposed to a gaze at times that at times borders on the pornographic, the country of progress. But is the event incomprehensible? Can we explain it? Certainly, there is a complex web of factors that contributed to the sheer scale of the disaster. I will turn to history and try to shed some light on why the events are being produced as incomprehensible. The obvious. Haiti came into being through a successful trade revolution. In 1804, Dessalines declared Saint-Domingue independent from France. Under the Amero-Indian name of Haiti, the first black <coughs> state in the Americas realized a complete reversal of imperial hierarchy and social goals. Slaves had become masters, and the export-oriented plantation economy has been severely disrupted. 
This was not supposed to happen. Not in the slaveholding Atlantic, where slaves were big business. Half the sugar and coffee consumed in Europe and the US was being produced in San Roman, the pearl of the Antilles. This was not supposed to happen in a different sense, too. Slaves cannot liberate themselves. Abolitionism is one thing, revolutionary slaves another. The slave owners throughout the Atlantic were forewarned, although they officially pretended that Haiti did not exist. They started to take precautions. Despite Haiti and despite moderate abolitionist activities in some European capitals, the area cultivated by slaves in the New World grew significantly by, had grown significantly by the mid-19th century and the main slave economy, Cuba, the US, and Brazil, emerged strengthened from the period of contention in the earlier part of the 19th century. Needless to say, this was not a hospitable environment for the only post-slavery state. Haiti was ostracized. El fantasma Guarico is the use of Saint Cuba. France recognized Haiti in 1825 in exchange for an exorbitant indemnity. It took Haiti a hundred years to pay back that debt. A huge drain on a country that was trying to rebuild after a devastating revolution that may have killed as many as a third of the 500,000 former slaves. The Vatican refused recognition in, uh, until 1860, a fact of significant consequence since the church tended to be the institution in charge of education in most post-independent states in the Americas. The U.S. did not grant diplomatic recognition until 1862, and he will all recognize the significance of that date. As Sidney Mintz once said, the surprising thing is not that Haiti fared badly, but that it fared at all. And actually, when we look at 19th century Haiti, the situation could have been far worse. Unlike most Spanish-American countries, it was not consumed by fratricidal wars. There was a subsistence economy in place that seemed to work, and a livable, though massively unequal, arrangement uh, of power between the colonial, the old colonial elite and the black masses. But never mind the relative success of 19th century Haiti. Much of contemporary perception of Haiti continues to be shaped by a revolutionary history that was not supposed to happen. The Haiti as the dark, dangerous, fierce threat to the rule of law and reason. A security threat. You should be surprised by this. You should be saying, how can it be 200 years later, after a civil war to abolish slavery, after civil rights struggles, after black power, after so much effort to overcome racial subjugation and subordination? And yes, there is of course a lot of history between the revolution and the catastrophe that befell Haiti on January 12th. But let me try to put just one line through this, and I'm sure other panelists will pursue others. The revolution started 1791 with a religious ceremony led by the Jamaican-born black man called Dati Bukman. It is said that a pig was slaughtered. Participants were sworn to absolute loyalty in the struggle to kill all the whites. Historians continue to disagree about the exact nature of the event and its meaning. In the Haitian national imagination, however, it marks the beginning of the uprising in the north from where it soon spread through the entire colony. In commemoration, of Guacaymán, there is now every year a small pilgrimage to the site of Guacaymán in the north. Here is how a website run by fundamentalist Protestants in the U.S., whose mission, acknowledged mission, is to support long-term missionaries in Haiti, describes Guacaymán, the Guacaymán ceremony. I cite, on August 14, 1791, many slave leaders of Haiti had held a secret meeting at which they dedicated their country to Satan. Every year since then, witch doctors have met to rededicate the country to Satan. And pre President Jean Bertrand Aristide, a Roman Catholic priest, renewed the vow in 2004. When the Haitians won their independence from Napoleon's armies in 1804, they attributed their victory to Voodoo. You can look this up on www.bombagai.com. <laughs> which, I, which ironically means good business, a good deal. It's a not kind of a commercial kind of thing. <laughs> One wishes this website was unusual. Alas, it isn't. And you could go to the website by Elizabeth Eames in Blogspot to find more examples of uh, such nonsense. Okay, you might say this is religious fringe stuff. 
What does it have to do with contemporary views on Haiti, with CNN and ABC coverage? Well, let me just recall Pat Robertson's uh, comment, former pre Republican presidential candidate, who shared his view recently with U.S. audiences that Haiti is cursed because it was founded on a devil's head. But more troubling in some ways is the, is the secular version of this view, which sneaked into the opinion pages of the New York Times, I cite. Haiti, like most of the world's poorest nations, suffers from a complex wave of progress-resistant cultural influences. There's the influence of the voodoo religion, which spreads the message that life is capricious and planning futile. The high levels of social mistrust, responsibility, is often not internalized. So where does this come from? This is David Brooks in the New York Times, by now notorious, of course. Um, where does this come from? When did you last hear from hard-nosed political commentators uh, about patterns of internalization of moral sentiment? But the main point really is would be the supposedly progress-resistant structure that keeps Haiti from joining us all in the path of progress. Let me just say one thing. Um, you know, voodoo is just one of the many Afro-Atlantic religions, like Santeria, like San Blake, which focuses on community and healing. There are evil spells, there are also good spells, uh, and it's a glorious way to celebrate abundance in conditions of scarcity. And, let us not forget, a living memory of the slave revolution of 1804. Why is it that a mainstream commentator feels entitled to attribute progress resistance to voodoo? If they're worried, quite wrongly, in my view, about fatalism. Why aren't they worried about Calvinism and notions of predestination? <laughs> One thing is clear. In 1804, something happened that was not supposed to be possible. Slaves liberated themselves. It's the unthinkable, the slave owner's worst nightmare. A nightmare, not reality. So, one concludes, it was possible only because of the pact with the devil. What came up? Another person fundamental side puts it, from the time of its freedom, Haiti has been in chains. A remarkable statement. For Haitian freedom, freedom from slavery, is actually not freedom at all. It is because of voodoo that insurgent slaves became masters. Because of voodoo that Haiti is irredeemably poor and violence prone. Freedom, then, has to be secured by others. U.S. Marines, Protestant missionaries, <laughs> and development and experts who understand that progress can only be made against the descendants of revolutionary slaves, not with them. Let us be very watchful when we read stories about Haiti in these dark days. Our next Advisor of a conference on the never-ending transition from Duvaliersen in Haiti to be held next year at Class and Gallatin. Like many of us have been trying to make sense of all this, and what I've been doing for the past couple of days is uh, grieving and writing. Um, what has become apparent over the past week is that the response to this earthquake in Haiti produced another Pan-American moment within a global uh, discourse on the tensions between militarism and humanitarianism. Uh, inter international cooperation, political intervention, and security. And as, you, as you can understand, all these kind of ideas are kind of full of contradiction. Pan-Americanism, which maintains its complicated roots, R-O-O-T-S, and roots, R-O-U-T-S-E-S, and 19th century U.S., Caribbean, and Latin American foreign policy, <coughs> proved paradoxically useful for Washington officials in spreading the U.S. style of democracy, promoting mutual cooperation, egalitarianism, and non-intervention between American states. At the same time, implementing gunboat diplomacy, military occupation, and dollar diplomacy. Caribbeans, Caribbean people, and Latin American people also have their own idea and version of Pan-Americanism. They employ the ideology more to, under, to benefit from U.S. foreign assistance programs, to challenge U.S. military aggression, political economic intervention, and 
began to assert a historical bond of colonialism. In spite of the history of direct challenges to a U.S. style of Pan-Americanism by Caribbean and Latin American people, Asians obviously included, U.S.-based aid and credit organizations and programs that are ideologically rooted within Pan-American uh, policies such as FDR's Good Neighbor Policy, Harry Truman's Point Four program, the Inter-American Development Bank, and USAID, USAID, These policies and programs continue to have a profound influence on the region. These institutions and assistance programs have made some improvements in Haiti and other Caribbean and Latin American countries. Uh, I was just there in 2009, in August 2009, and uh, volunteering at a summer camp in Sticky Club, which is about two hours away from Port au Prince. Um, and I remember the smooth wooden desks that, and benches that were at the school uh, that were provided by USAID. However, it's critical to note that these same inter-American bodies easily found within the Washington, D.C. grid of avenues named after U.S. states often fail to critique U.S. foreign policy, structural loan programs, and the history of underdevelopment due to U.S. occupation, obviously within Haiti in 1915 and 1934, also military aggression, U.S. financial receivership, in which the U.S. took over uh, uh, Haiti's banks, bank, banking system, and political meddling in the Caribbean and Latin America since the turn of the 20th century. The world has responded to this disastrous earthquake that has devastated Haiti's capital city, obviously a mammoth humanitarian effort. If there's some uh, there's some concern about Haitians in the diaspora, leftist intellectual circles, even French state officials, that humanitarianism is being supplanted by U.S. militaristic maneuvers in Washington interventionist politics. Why has the Obama administration chosen to primarily administer this humanitarian effort through the Pentagon, Department of Defense, instead of exclusively with non-military based institutions? Why has the U.S. Air Force taken over control of the San Francisco Air Force? Although there are reports of U.S. and Canadian military bringing unloaded weapons to Haiti, Canada's committed 2,000 soldiers possess, quote, strict rules of engagement to defend themselves, as well as the United Nations and local police, end quote, from, from their general, Natchezek, chief of the Canadian Defense Forces. What are those rules of engagement? And are, the, and are there national security implications for the U.S. and Canada? What are Additionally, in spite of moratoriums on deportation of Haitian illegal migrants uh, in the United States and the Bahamas, and Haitians in the U.S. who are granted temporary protected status, how do we address an immediate and pervasive culture of fear of Haitian migration in the U.S. and the Caribbean? These are just some of the questions that continue to trouble me as I'm thinking about and also have some of the hemispheric. One, the Gay Haitian Anthology, published in 1999, Haiti and the United States, 1997, and Literature and Ideology in Haiti, 1915 to 1961. He has represented CARICOM and the Caribbean Conference of Churches on official missions to Haiti. All right. Thank you. Um, well, I just have points, as Ada suggested we do. Which um, uh, I will just speak a little bit about, um, which could probably generate questions later on. First point is neocolonialism. Um, hidden behind Haiti's spectacular beginning, truly spectacular beginning, is the fact that Haiti is also the world's, the world's longest experiment in neocolonialism. That is, the morning after independence in 1804, Haiti was a pariah state. Recognition by France at terrible cost, by the US later on, only increased Haiti's dependency. The occupation of 1915 
but it is squarely within the American sphere of influence. The fact, this fact of dependency has shaped Haitian society on the inside as well as on the outside. On the outside, it has given uh, the US and France, the US in particular, further, an enormous say in what happens in Haiti. On the inside, it has strengthened and supported an elite, which essentially are the brokers between the new colonial powers on the outside and the Haitian nation that produces on the inside. A market dominant elite, which each time there is an intervention, benefits from these inter interventions. So recently, the, 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 the Clinton Initiative in Haiti essentially meant investments. Investments in what? Investments in uh, uh, light assembly, um, investments in essentially the things that this market, market dominant elite does. Um, so that uh, the first point I want us to keep in mind is this question of neocolonialism and the stalled nature of Haiti since 1804. Haiti is a stalled society since 1804, and in fact, you could start seeing the symptoms of the failed state from 1804 because Haiti is not allowed to advance essentially because of what I see as a sustained experiment in neocolonial domination. Point one. Point two, Haitian exceptionalism. Haitians are loved or hated because they are apparently different. Brooks in the Times can tell us that Haiti has a progress resistant society because of voodoo fatalism, but he also said, interestingly, poor child rearing practices. <laughs> Where does that come from? <laughs> well, I know if you read Robert Rothberg's book, The Politics of Squalor. That's what Rothbard says. Haitians have poor child-rearing practices to create maladjusted adults. That's why they're in that terrible situation that they were in, I think his book is in the 1950s. However, I don't think the problem stops there. Those are the easy targets. The harder target, I think, is my friend, Madison Smart said who then presents Haiti as mystical. Haiti is mystical, and you hear people, well-meaning people talk about Haiti being the most spiritual place on earth. Well, Haiti is no more mystical or spiritual than Jamaica or Brooklyn. 